praise God. Welcome to Grace Fellowship. We're delighted tonight. We have a special speaker. Reverend Prophet Evangelist Woody Woodson's with us, who always has a word for us in proper timing, a precise word. Now, I need to warn the con congregation. I took him to lunch today to Columbia Steakhouse, and he had a garlic butter steak. Yeah. So we yeah. thought we're going to have a prayer line later. <laughs> and anyone that doesn't go down has COVID. <laughs> no. <laughs> Here's a vampire, right? Yeah. <laughs> so stand with me and welcome <laughs> Prophet, Evangelist, <laughs> Reverend Woody Woodson. Hallelujah. You're loving Jesus tonight. Come on, come on, come on, somebody. How many of you are all in? All in. See, I, I believe it's an all in time. See, if we're going to follow God, let's be all in. Come on now. Not half hearted. All in. There's an anointing for all in people. Come on. Well, if you've got your Bible, you can be seated. I'm going to be all over the place tonight. I always am. I just, I always say I don't know how to preach. I know how to fill up and explode, and that's just it. But I'm going to open up in Isaiah chapter 3 because it's something I need to say to you tonight, especially with what's going on. And one of my friends posted it. Right before I left, I read it online. I said, that's good, man. So I'm going to use it. But it's Isaiah 3, verse 10. It says, say to the righteous that it will go well with them, for they will eat the fruit of their actions. Verse 11 says, woe to the wicked. It will go badly with them, for what they deserve will be done to them. I honestly believe that's where we're at. We're in literally in the glory, and in the glory is both goodness and severity. The glory brings blessing, and it also literally brings a curse for those that don't receive the glory when it's available. They literally begin to operate under the curse. It's kind of dangerous when God turns up his power. And it's so funny because of the, the scripture, that one of the scriptures I read every day this year as something God told me is Ezekiel 37. So, and you know, she read it about the prophet being dropped in the valley of dry bones. We know that. And that literally, God tells the prophet, number one, can they live? That's a good thing. We have to believe they can live or they won't. We won't do anything if we don't believe it can change. Come on now. And he says, speak life, speak life, speak life. And then it says, prophesy to the wind. And when they prophesied to the wind, a great army came together. The bones came together. And literally, the great army was released. Until the wind came, they were assembled, but they weren't an army yet. Come on. But when the wind hit, they became a great army. And in, in, in Ezekiel 37, verse 11, it goes on. He explains the vision. And he says, he said to me, son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. I believe he could say right now, these bones are the church. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up. And our hope has perished. So many believers have given up hope, thrown away their confidence. We're completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land. See what God's saying, I'm bringing everything back to life. I'm bringing everything back to life. There are things I've promised you. I'll put my spirit within you, and you will come to life, and I'll place you on your own land. Come on. See, we're at a time where it's revival or bust. There's no other option. Either a revival hits this nation, or this nation is going to fall. You know? 
And I'm grateful for the political system. But be honest with you, I have a greater system I operate under. And I'll be honest with you also, we cannot put our trust in man's system. We cannot. Because without revival, it makes no, no difference who the president is. But we do have a window of opportunity. Come on. Do you hear what I'm saying? You know, God's about ready to do something through the church, something mighty that the gates of hell will not prevail against, that literally cannot be stopped. And God's about ready to pour out a fresh oil, a revival fire, come on, that's going to consume people with the fire of God. And literally, people are going to become all in. I don't know if you understand things, what's going on prophetically, but prophetically, many of you, you don't, you didn't even do anything to change it. Your appetites are changing because it's in the spirit. And all of a sudden, the things that used to entertain you do not entertain you anymore. They're boring. Now, you're going to say, I played sports. I played a high level of sports. I can't watch it. It's so boring. <laughs> I just can't. I said, God, compared to you, this is boring. Yes. Compared to what you can do, this is nothing. And I don't know about you, but I, there was a, there's a saying in the world that says, hindsight is 2020. <laughs> and I am so grateful that 2020 is in my hindsight. Yes. <laughs> Come on now, forgetting what lies behind. I'm not going to be like Lot's wife. I'm not looking back. Because to be honest, with you, I don't want to look back on this last year. And it doesn't mean we had a bad year. In some ways, we had one of the best years we've ever had. We saw the faithfulness of God over and over again. We, you know, I got to know God in certain ways. But honestly, I, I never, ever, ever recall bad things. Never. I'll build on the good. But I don't look back and say, oh, well, that was a bad year. No, it wasn't a bad year. I got through it. <laughs> but I expect a better year this year. <laughs> Come on, does this make sense? See, on December 28th, every year I wait for something to explode in me to say, okay, God, what is a theme that's going on? In December 28th of this year, in my spirit, last year I actually heard a distinct roar of a lion. This year in my spirit, I heard a war cry. And it was strong. It got me right to attention. And then God gave me Psalm 1834, I will train your hands for war. He said, son, you know how to fight on one level. I'm going to teach you how to fight on a whole different level. Because this, this is a time for war. It's a time to really fight, to reclaim and get things back. Does this make sense? I, I, I began to, you know, that, that it shook me when I heard that. And, you know, I love what 18, you know, Psalm 1833 talks about. I will, God's given us feet like Heinz feet, to climb to high places. Then he said, I'll train your hands for war. You'll send the high places. Why? Because honestly, until you exalt your position above your condition, nothing can change. You need to know who you are in Christ. Then you come to life. And I began to, you know, a few days later in my scripture reading, I went to Isaiah 42, 13. I'm going to give you a lot tonight. I hope you like it. If you don't, I'm still going to, I leave town anyway, so I'm good. <laughs> but Isaiah 40, you know, 42, verse 13, and it's funny, how many of you have ever read through the Bible in year, I've read through the Bible three times a year for over 40 years. So I've read about at least the Bible 120 times in my life, probably more than that. And so there's not a verse in this Bible I've never read, but there's verses I've never seen. Come on. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because every season of your life, God highlights different things. 
things that didn't speak to you in the last season and you just went right over them because it wasn't the season for it. Then all of a sudden the Holy Ghost begins to take it and then the season comes out and it makes it comes alive on the inside of you. Well, Isaiah 42 verse 13 really got my attention because God had just talked to me a, a, a couple of days before that about the war cry. And New American Standard says the Lord will go forth like a warrior. He will arouse his zeal like a man of war. He will utter a shout. Yes, he will raise a war cry is what it says in New American Standards. And you see, and he says, and he will prevail against his enemies. Come on. So the war cry means God's going to prevail. Come on. God's going to prevail that literally the Lion of Judah is on the move. And I believe the war cry in the spirit causes us to put our trumpet to the lips, our lips on earth with a distinct sound calling people to war. That's 1 Corinthians 14. There's a cause right now. We have to fight for this nation. We're going to have to, have, we're going to, have to fight to get God back in everything. Because literally, the enemy's trying to steal everything. And he's put blinders on eyes, and we better play, pray those blinders off. Come on. It's time. God is raising up a prophetic people in this day and this hour. And we're going to have to live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, not by just what he's spoken, but what he is speaking. Because there is a now word. And it, literally, the now word is what's going to cause the enemy to bow. Come on. There's a thus saith the Lord going out right now. There's a prophetic army, and there's a people that God has given you vision in your life, but you're going to have to fight a good fight according to the prophecies made over you. What has God showed you? Because I guarantee you, if what God shows you is this is all there is, it wasn't God. Because without a prophetic vision, without a prophetic revelation, people perish. See, what causes people to come out of a grave? A word. A prophetic word. A prophetic word calls people out. What is going to cause this nation to come to life? A prophetic word. Come on now. And once they hear that prophetic word and that prophetic sound, the dead are going to come to life. Come on now. And there are going to be people coming out of their religious bondage. Come on. And there are going to be literally people that have been waiting for that sound. We're in a different prophetic time period. Stronger than ever before. And literally, God is going to exalt some and he's going to put down some because he's the judge. And there have been people who have been playing with this thing for long enough, trying to fake an anointing. Trying to entertain. Using all the hype there was. And God's about ready to turn the tables because there have been people for years that have been in the background God's going to put in the foreground. See, I, I begin to hear in my spirit, enough is enough. And it's funny because the day I posted that, someone sent me the, uh, that prayer journal from Dutch Sheets that day, which I, I, know, I like Dutch, but I just haven't followed it. But on that day, his theme was enough is enough. Because I think it's time when God gave us all, all authority, not some. It's time we put down our foot and say, no more. No more. Whatever we bind will be bound. Whatever we loose will be loosed. I think we've put up with way too much. This garbage. And that's going to bring me to where I am right now because, you know, I asked him, God, what are you doing? He said, I'm bringing all the misfits together. He said, this last revival is a misfit revival. He said, there are a bunch of pieces who never fit in any other move. He said, I'm not saying they weren't part of it. 
but they didn't really fit. And he said there was a reason they didn't fit because the whole message of the kingdom is you don't fit, you take over. And he said the only place these misfits fit are in the body of Christ. How many of you, when you watch the news and watch this nation right now, you feel like, I don't fit? I mean, I've, this is so weird to me. They, they, it's like I'm an alien, literally an alien, looking at these weird people. I said, like, I don't fit here, God. He said, I never called you to fit here. He said, if you fit here, you couldn't fit there. You couldn't fit in me if you fit here. Come on. Because you can't change it if you're in love with it. Come on. And I started thinking about that. All the weird people God calls. Not many are wise in 1 Corinthians 1.24. It talks about the called ones. There are not many wise according to the flesh. They're not very strong people. They're not, and God, God seems to call people nobody else would want. Because most people he calls are, are, are not group speak people. They're originals. And originals make everyone else nervous because everyone else, there's so much in the world that there's pressure to conform. If there's so much pressure in our culture, if we don't say what the group speaks, and be honest with you, I will not say what the groups, I say what he speaks. And guess what? He's not part of that group. <laughs> Come on. They won't let him in. They don't want him. That's a sad thing. But God's going to use the foolish things to confound the wise. I started thinking about some of the people. See, your faith needs to be stronger than your excuses. Your hunger has to trump your history. Because I started thinking people like Moses. When God got to Moses, he's on the backside of the wilderness hiding out. Now, he, he tried to deliver a thing once. <laughs> Almost got him killed. And he decided, I've... I'm done, baby. I am done. I am retiring. I'm hiding out. But God knew his hiding place. And he came in the burden bush, and the bush talked to Moses. And if you saw a bush on fire that knew your name, <laughs> hey, Mo. He walked over to see what it was. He said, Moses, take off your shoes. If a bush on fire tells me to take off my shoes, they're off, baby. <laughs> he said, this is holy ground, whatever you say. But I really think it's funny. And then God says, I've heard the cry of my people, and I'm going to send you. And Moses' attitude was, send whoever you will but me. He started making excuses. He said, who am I? God said, not about you. It's about me. I'll be with you. He said, well, then who are you? I thought I knew you last time. Look where I am. He said, I am that I am. How will they know? He said, what's in your hand? He said, you already have something in your hand that if you'll yield it to me, will be literally be used for all the miracles you'll ever do. Every one of you has something already in your hand. It's already been deposited in you. It's a gift that will make room for you in the presence of great men, but it cannot make room for you until you give it to God because there's still a snake in it until it's God's. Then he said, I can't speak, and that was my excuse when he called me in the ministry. Because I could hit a 100-mile-an-hour fastball, and I, I got videos to prove it. But if you put me in front of 10, 15 people, in a classroom, I'd cut the class if I had to speak. 
I mean, I'd either stutter the entire time. I used to talk so fast that people were waiting for the interpretation. <laughs> and it was just I was so frustrated. My knees would knock. I would just, I, I was terrified. And God said, well, I would never forget when God said, I'm calling you to be a preacher. I said, no, you're not. <laughs> I said, I can't speak. He said, I didn't ask you where you could speak. I just said, you you're called. I said, well, it's going to have to be you. He said, about time you knew that. <laughs> Come on. But we see this with Moses. We see it with almost everyone God's ever used. There were there, there people who didn't fit. You see it with Gideon. I mean, who would have chosen Gideon? His family was the poorest family in Judges chapter 6. He's hiding the wine press from the enemy, and he is the youngest in the poorest family. He's I'm the least of the least. And God looked at him and called him valiant warrior. I'm sure he looked in the mirror and called himself Chicken Little for years. But God has a way of doing something. And when God labels you, if you'll accept that label, you'll actually become what he labeled you. Come on. And the only one that has a right to define you is the one who designed you. So don't live by the definition of man, but do live by the definition of God. And we know Gideon became a valiant warrior. We know Jeremiah, when, when, when God came to Jeremiah, he was just a little child, a youth. Called him to be a prophet to the nations. And I, I'm going to establish something biblically. People ask me, when does life begin? I say, in eternity. Because the Bible says, I knew you before you ever were conceived. <sighs> Think about that. Every one of you are older than dirt. <laughs> because before the earth was even created, God knew you. So every one of you is older than this earth. <laughs> Come on. And, and, and he said, when God called him to be a prophet to the nations, he said, who am I? He said, I'm just a youth. And God said, don't say you're just a youth. He said, everywhere you, I call you, you're going to go. I'm going to put my words in your mouth. But each one of them, did, what changed was an encounter with the glory of God. Because once the glory gets on you, everything changes. Come on. See, a photograph is a burst of light that leaves an impression. That's what it is. And literally, the entrance of his word brings light. You know what the entrance of his word does? It changes the picture. <sighs> changes the picture, changes the reality. It's a new reality when, you, when you, you have the entrance of his word and you get a prophetic word in your life. See, whenever you see genuine passion, get ready for a move of God. It's on the way. Fire spreads. This last day's revival is going to be a Davidic army being raised up. God's restoring the tabernacle of David. And in that restoration, according to Acts 15, 16, and 17, it says, when I restore the tabernacle of David, it's, it's so that the entire world can seek me. It's the key to everything. Send the praisers first. Because without the presence, the praise brings the presence. Without the presence, we have nothing. Come on. But David was a worshiper and a warrior. And God's raising up worshipers and warriors in this last day. And I started thinking about how God begins, he's raising up a David generation. And then most of us, honestly, I believe there's a whole generation that's been hidden to be revealed. The whole earth is in travail until the ultimate revelation. That's the revelation of the sons of God. Come on, the unveiling. 
the coming forth. And many of us, you know, David was a number eight. I call him number eight because he was the eighth son. And when God spoke to Samuel, I mean, and he said, you, you, you need to anoint, Saul's lost his anointing. You need to anoint a new king. And he said, go to Jesse's home. And he went to Jesse's home. He said, show me your sons. Jesse called seven sons, not the eighth. And he parade, paraded all seven sons in front. And to be honest with you, Samuel was real impressed with the first one. As soon as he saw him walk in, he said, surely this is the guy. He looks good. And God said, no. no. He saw seven sons, and then he said, there's got to be another one. I know I heard from God. Is this all your sons you have? He said, we got one in the field. <laughs> he said, you know, even, even Jesse had to probably think, do I have another one? <laughs> I mean... <laughs> He was the forgotten one. Come on. You know, it's always the last child. You know, it's always the last child. You know, the first child gets all the pictures. The last child, nothing. <laughs> we did that enough times. Forget you. <laughs> it's usually the case. Huh? It sounds sad. But David, we see David was a man of purpose. He's a man of presence, and he was a man of passion. Acts 13, 22 talks about how he's a man after God's own heart. And that he would fulfill his purpose, God's purpose for his generation. And there was a favor in his life that was opening up. You know, I started thinking just about, you know, what, what David was, he was doing on that thing. And you see, you see David... When, when the prophet went to Jesse's house, it was the prophet that actually said it was a prophetic call on David. The prophet said, bring the boy. Call the boy. And when the boy came in, it says, he anointed David with oil. And he said, from that moment on, the spirit of God came upon him mightily and never left. That's pretty strong. See, God chooses people we wouldn't choose. And you know, Jesse didn't even recognize his own son. And I'll guarantee you, there are a lot of people that the world does not recognize, and you, you feel like no one has recognized you yet. But though your beginning is insignificant, your end is going to greatly increase. David was relegated to the fields. He was reviled by his brothers and overlooked by his father. But God remembered David. And I'm going to tell you something. Some of you, you may even feel like God's forgotten you, but he's not forgotten you, but there comes a day when he remembers you. You start thinking about, you know, all throughout Scripture. When, you know, when Joseph's mom was, is that, which one was that? Was it Rebecca? Rachel, okay. I always want to say Rebecca because she's back there. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> but Rachel, Rachel cried out and said, give me children lest I die. She was barren. And she kept crying and crying and crying. And then one day it says, God remembered Rachel. Opened her womb. And she didn't just give birth to this child. She gave birth to a deliverer, a mighty deliverer named Joseph. Joseph literally saved Israel and saved Egypt at the same time. Then I think of Hannah. Again, feeling barren. Some of us, we have felt barren in some areas of our life. And we've done everything we know to produce fruit. Come on. And she wanted a child so bad, but she was barren. And she went to the 
house of the Lord. And she was so distraught that Eli, the priest, thought she was drunk. And he actually accused her of being drunk. He said, no. He said, I'm just distraught. I'm grieved. I'm in travail. And be honest with you, there's a part of this nation right now where the church, part of me is that way right now. Because until Zion travails, she doesn't birth anything. And, and Eli said, by this time next year, you'll have a child. Well, she didn't just have a child. You understand, when she gave birth, it said God remembered Hannah. But in remembering Hannah, he remembered Israel. Because until then, the word of the Lord was rare. She gave birth to Samuel, and Samuel literally restored the word of the Lord to Israel. She gave birth to the voice of God. We about ready to birth the voice of God throughout the whole earth. Come on. You hear what I'm saying? See, there's something going on. See, God equips the undervalued. He prepares the forgotten to exalt them at the right time. They've humbled themselves under his hand. They've been hidden till it was their time to be revealed. They've been like a quiver in, that, in Isaiah 49, 2. In the, in, literally, in the, they were like an arrow in the quiver of the Lord. And, you know, there probably were a lot of other arrows in the quiver that, that the Lord kept using. And there were probably inferior arrows. I'm sorry. And you look and say, why didn't you choose me? He said, your time will come. And you know what? You know what? When they put an arrow in the quiver, you know what they constantly are doing? They're balancing the arrow. Because if an arrow is not properly balanced, it will not hit the target. So for years, many of us have been properly balanced for our time. Happy we been released when we thought we should be released. We would have done more damage than good. Come on. Does this make sense? See, the ultimate hiding has been the sons of God. The whole earth is travailing for it. Does this make sense? See, literally, your gift will make room for you when your gift is needed. And your gift will make room for you in the presence of great men. And to see, the key of David is the heart for God, his will, and his ways. That's what it is. The key of David will open doors no one can shut and shut doors no one can open. It's like the keys of the kingdom. Because you won't know what key to use unless you, are, you have a heart for God. See, even Saul was afraid of David. You know, there are people that are totally, there are people that may hate you, but they're, they're afraid of you too. I have people right now, and I guarantee you something. One of the things I confess every day is those that bless me are blessed, those that curse me are cursed. Out of Genesis chapter 12. And I know it. And every time everyone's ever come against me, it's hurt them bad. They've been hurt bad. And I don't want to be hurt. That's weird because as soon as I do it, I used to get upset and say, oh, God, take care of this. Just take care of them. Now it's like God have mercy on them. Because I know God's like a doting parent. You touch their baby, watch out. <laughs> Come on. The Bible says, touch not my anointing. Do my prophets no harm. It's a dangerous thing. And when you carry God's presence, no weapon formed against you can prosper. In fact, if you carry the presence of God, God will actually use you to execute the judgment. And it says, every, every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, he says, I give you the privilege, you will condemn it. Come on. Something's about ready to take place. Does this make sense? See, David's life was one of obscurity. Most of his life was spent alone with his sheep and God. 
just worshiping, praying, fighting off lions and bears when no one was noticing. Come on. But that suddenly changed. See, David did not know when no one else was watching him, God was. The eyes of the Lord have been going to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards him. God was watching David care for the sheep. And you got to understand something. He was put down because he was in. The only reason he, you know, he was in that position is he's the youngest son. And his brother said, you're, aren't you going to tend a few sheep? Come on. But he, David took it seriously, and God saw the integrity of his heart. And there are a lot of pastors, honestly, who have been tending a very few sheep that God is about ready to exalt into a position where it's going to be an explosion. Come on, because God says, I'm going to take you from the sheepfold, and I'm going to give you an authority over an entire nation. There's a fresh anointing going on. David was in the wilderness tending the sheep, but it's there where he learned how to be still and know that he's God. There where he wrote with so much of his worship. In fact, it was his time alone that prepared him for leadership. Because if you can't stand alone, you think you cannot lead. And to be honest with you, we have such a leadership vacuum in this nation. It's incredible. It's absolutely incredible how many people, they, 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 they'll hang in groups, but they don't know how to lead. They, ha- they have a title. Just makes sense. And see, God told the prophet, he said, look for the overlooked one. God's now about ready to look for the overlooked ones. And you couldn't fit anywhere else, but you'll fit in this move because the only place you fit is the body of Christ. It's the only place you fit, and the only way you fit is you're being your unique self, but rightly connected to other unique selves. That's the only way you fit. This makes sense. See, God's misfits, and I only say they're misfits not because they're, they're anything wrong, because they weren't, they couldn't fit in the old system. But you'll find out something, they'll celebrate the successes of others because they're not competing. When you're unique, you're not comparing yourself. I always said, you know, if we all had to be the same, only I would be needed. <laughs> That's what I said, you know. In fact, in fact, even God offered Moses that deal. He heard all the complaining of the people. He said, Moses, I just want to start over just with you. I want to wipe them out. And Moses had to stand in the gap. <laughs> He probably was thinking about the deal, but he thought, nah, 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 I love these people in spite of them. (laughs) Come on now. See, you'll find out about misfits in a sense this generation is we're eager to learn. We're not know-it-alls. Have you ever been around people who are know-it-alls? It bugs me. It bugs me. They, They just know it all. I mean, you ever get around people, and honestly... You ever get around people, they, 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 they have their whole act together because it's just an act. <laughs> I mean, real people are always growing, always moving. You know what it's like? I mean, honestly, we're, we don't have to be perfect. We're perfect in him, but we're not definitely not perfect on the outside. Come on. See, you're, 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 you're slow to speak. You're quick to learn. And you're willing to wait because you have to. You have to. Faith and patience. You either wait or you quit. You either wait or you quit. And if you and if you quit, you've gone as far as you possibly can go. 
But faith and patience inherit the promises. You got to count it all joy. I had to count it all joy almost all last year. Count it all joy. <laughs> you know, because a lot of times I was scheduled here. And the church closed down because of COVID. Scheduled here. The church closed down because of COVID. My brother, my son lives in California, which is cray cray. It is, man. Their regulations are ridiculous. You come, you, where my son is, I fly in, I have, to, I have to quarantine for 14 days before I can even see him. And when I leave, he has to quarantine. What is that? There's absolute control and stupidity. If it worked, then it should be working. And their numbers are terrible. Come on. Does this make sense? See, what you're going to find out about, about the type of people I'm talking about is they keep going. They're so persistent. They're like in Luke chapter 18. They're going day and night, day and night, reminding the, the judge of what he said. Yeah. This is what it says. This is what I want. This is what it said. This is what I want. Come on. They are persistent people, and they don't take no for an answer. They trust God. Because they know God is fighting their battles. I guarantee you, you don't have to fight the battle, but you have to show up. Years ago, I was having a conversation with the Lord, and I said, Lord, if I was a professional wrestler, I would be called road warrior. And the Lord said, you are a professional wrestler. You got to understand, I travel 150,000 miles a year, and I've done it for almost 40 years now. So that's a lot of tread under this baby. And I said, Lord, I'd be a ro-. He said, you are a professional wrestler. I said, I am. He said, I said, am I any good? You understand, I'm so competitive. I am so, I'm like more competitive than anybody. Literally. I play until I win. My brother will tell you that. We play poker, and I would be so far behind, so far behind. But we are not going to bed until I win. And he, I mean, he would be like three hundred thousand dollars up on me on fake, fake money. But still, I mean, there's no way I'm going to cash him. But it's four in the morning. He's, I quit. I said, I win. Because <laughs> we play until I win. That's the rules. <laughs> And see, you, know, you, you need to understand that God, I said, God, if, I, am I any good? He said, you're part of the greatest tag team ever. I, he said, you're a champion. I said, thank you. I said, a tag team, who's my partner? He said, I am. I said, are we undefeated? He said, no. I said, how can I lose with you as my partner? He said, because sometimes you want to fight first. I'll handle this one. God, this is, hey, God, you just stay in the corner. I don't need you on this one. I'll handle this one. <laughs> oh, that is, that, that is always hurt. <laughs> and he said, but when you let me go first, I literally wipe it total out. And when the enemy can't move at all, I tag. And somehow you stumble on and land on top. <laughs> and you get credit. <laughs> Was he okay? He said, but there's another, there's another couple of matches we've lost. I said, how could I lose if I send you first? He said, because you didn't show up. And because I'm not allowed to fight unless you show up. Because those are the rules, and those are the rules of the kingdom. God still needs a body. He still needs us to show up, and he cannot fight. He cannot win the battle without us. We have got to be there, but he has got to be the star. He's got to be the one doing the heavy lifting, but we have still got to be there. Does this make sense? See, you need to understand this. See, when I found out about this type of group, we are so separated to God, we're always in worship and praise. 
His praise is continually in our mouth, continually, continually. We're always in prayer. And, you know, prayer is talking to God. It's not being weird. You know, I don't normally have extended periods of prayer. I do and I don't. But most of the day, I, I don't think I go more than a few minutes without talking to God. <laughs> Almost all the time, I always say, you're always, you're always doing like this thing. I said, well, that's because he's with me. <laughs> I'm aware about it. There are times I'm, who are you talking to? <laughs> you talking to me? I said, you got the kid. I wouldn't be talking to you. <laughs> I'm talking. <laughs> I'm talking to the one who can change you. <laughs> <laughs> Get real. <laughs> See, what I found out about us too, we learn from our failures. So we fail forward. You know what I'm saying? See, a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up. Micah 7 8 says, though a man falls, he, a righteous man falls, he will get back up. It's not a question of falling. It's not a question of failing because you will. But God never fails. And when you fail, it doesn't make you a failure. What makes you a failure is when you decide you're a failure. And if you keep going, eventually you'll get to where you got to go. You'll be a hero just by sim- simply by the process of elimination. <laughs> I've just outlasted so many people. Now I'm in the front of the line. <laughs> Come on. And see, you have a balance between loving people and loving God. And I'll be honest with you. One of the things I have got to do, one of the hardest struggles I've had during this season was not, is not to take my wrath out on man. Because so many things get me angry. You know what I'm saying? I look at injustice. I look at certain things, say, that's not right. That's not right. But we see, I, the faith works by love. So I don't want to take it out on humanity. My, my warfare, my, my wrestling match is not against flesh and blood. It's against principalities and powers and evil spirit. And God, Jesus, even the people that were crucifying, he loved them, even while they were crucifying him. That's the challenge. I finally had to stop watching most social media, most news, because they would get me so upset. And I'm thinking, you know, you know what they're doing is they're showing me what's going on in the natural and dragging me down to a natural place where I got to stay in the spirit if I'm going to win. And there's no joy in the natural, just anger. And the anger of man will not work the righteousness of God. I'm not saying don't be angry. I'm saying don't be angry in your flesh. And take out your anger on the right enemy. Come on. Find the spirits. Recognize these people are being controlled just like you were before you got saved. Come on. Have that heart for God. Let the zeal of the Lord consume you. I don't know about you. I am more fired up than I've ever been in my life. I want to see this nation saved. I want to see all men saved, come to the knowledge of the truth. I want to see people delivered. I want to see them healed. I want to see them freed up. That's why the Spirit of the Lord's upon me. That's why he's anointed me. He's anointed me because there's people who need the anointing on me that need a touch from heaven, and without the anointing, they can't have. It's what it's all about. And you, you begin to learn the ways of royalty. What I've learned is your ways are not God's ways, and your thoughts are not God's thoughts until you embrace his thoughts. And he'll teach you his ways. I don't know how many times I used to tell my son, that's not the way Woodson's do it. I mean, he would do something, and, and you know, a lot of times he didn't know any better. He was a kid, a little tiny kid. I have to take him aside and say, that's not, that's not our DNA. That's not how we act. 
Come on, son. You're better than that. See, tradition dictated that Jesse relegate the responsibility of the sheep to the youngest son. But what looked like a field of the forgotten was actually a field of favor. Waiting for the set time of favor for what was being developed in the field to be put on. God has a way of taking broken situations and making them beautiful. Isolation in the field is preparation for leadership. Come on. In this time, David was separated from his family, but he was separated to God. During this time is when he learned to hear the voice of God. We've all been through those times where all we had was God. And he was more than enough. Does this make sense? The intimacy that David developed in the field would ultimately guide him the rest of his life. I found out something about misfits. They like, they like doing things secretly. They really don't like the limelight. Because what they do in secret will reward them openly. And honestly, they don't want to have to be seen unless they have to be seen. Jesus himself, you constantly, throughout the Gospels, you'd see him more times than ever trying to get away from people. <laughs> trying to get away to pray. Trying to get away. Trying to get away. It just it, The crowds followed him, but it didn't seem like he was enamored by crowds. He was enamored by the Father. Come on. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. See, the time in the field is what qualifies us to ignite a team, a city, a nation. Because we've been walking with the consuming fire. He's been waiting for the unveiling of the sons of God. Hidden. Hidden. Getting perfected. Many of them have going through stuff and say, how long, how long, how long, how long? They're the bunch that are satisfied but not satisfied. We love you, Jesus, but I know there's so much more, and God, I got to see more. And, you know, it's the reason I still do what I do. People ask me, I say, what? I, I don't have to do this anymore in the natural, which is a nice position to be in. But the bottom line is I've got something in my spirit I have to see birthed. That's where my heart is. I've got to see revival. I've got to see people come to Jesus. I feel responsible for this generation. I feel responsible. And I feel responsible to pass a baton to the next generation and ignite them. I feel so responsible. Because God's too much is given, much is required. There's a fire, guys. And we all have been misfits, but now we're fit together. And we need one another more than we ever have before. But we also need your uniqueness more than we ever have before. Come on. There's a gift that God wants to stir you up, stir you up, stir you. There's a special anointing and fire on those people who say, I'm all in, God. Here am I. Send me. And to be honest with you, we've already been commissioned because as the Father sent Jesus in the world, he says, so send I you. If God's going to do it, he absolutely needs us to show up because we're his body. And no excuses will get the job done. When you're a soldier, you report for duty, sir. 
It's a season. I know our church has grabbed hold of what I preached there a few months ago, the all-in message, and their whole theme is all-in. And, and we're seeing lives radically transformed. People said, you know, I used to go to the church, and now I am the church. I went to church because I wasn't all in. I am the church, which means when they still meet together. But I am the church because I am all in. Come on. Hear what I'm saying. How many of you tonight, you want a fresh anointing on your life? How many of you say, this is my year, this is my year, this is... How many of you believe in for some pretty big things, pretty outrageous things this year? I, I am right in the midst of all this craziness. You know, my son, in the midst of, his, of their craziness out there in, in, in California, their church has just exploded. And they're not even allowed to meet in buildings. Yeah, well, that that's the the Las Vegas church is the one that bought the they bought the one gambling machine because church was shut down, but casinos were open. <laughs> so they called themselves a casino, but they just had a long Bible study before. <laughs> oh my, my son's church! They invite people every week to go to the protest. He said, we're protesting the works of the devil. We're protesting. We got an outdoor protest. We have an outdoor protest. Just like the other people did, we have our outdoor protest. <laughs> it's so funny because they can't shut them down because it's a protest. He said, we, ours is really a peaceful protest. It's just not peaceful against the devil, but it's peaceful. <laughs> In fact, you go to our protest, you may get some peace. <laughs> Come on. How many of you say, man, I, I want prayer now. I, I want fresh anointing. I, I want to pray for people tonight, you know. I, I like doing that, you know. I recently went to a church, and I was, I was really concerned a little bit wh where they were with social distancing until I saw the 1,500 people that were there that night and realized they could not social distance whether they wanted to or not. Then I gave an altar call for prayer and say, if you, 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 I, I'll pray for you in your seats because I don't really care. I, and I feel that way still because there's no, there's no distance, you know, wherever where people are comfortable with. But I said, if you really, if you want me to lay hands on you, I'm comfortable with that. Huh. I had like 1,200 people come forward. I want to send some of them back. <laughs> you social distance. You know. <laughs> no. I know. This is going to be a long night. <laughs> <laughs> but how many of you tonight say, man, I want a fresh anointing. I want to just get the fire of God back in. I want, I want to start this year on fire and go from fire to fire, from glory to glory. Come on, from revelation to revelation. I, I, want, I, I want to shift out of the natural into the supernatural. Because many of us, honestly, I, I found out, I said, you know, God, God is basically, there are ways I was operating even through last year. He won't let me operate that way anymore. He said, no. He said, what I'm speaking, you got to speak. I said, but you used to give me a message a year in advance. He said, whatever I show you, that's what you got to do. Well, you know, and, and he said, you didn't do anything wrong before because that's the that way I was operating with you. He said, now, you're just going to have to continue to look and get ready to make adjustments on the, on the run because this is a different day. So if you want prayer, I want to pray for you. If you need a miracle, I want to pray for you.